All right, welcome. We're officially live to the final seminar of 2021. Matt and I were talking a little bit ago that this was an idea that we had back in 2013, I think, Matt. So this has been going pretty strong for quite a while. Always remember that you can go back and look at previous recordings, not until 13. We didn't start recording them and going live until 17, something like that. But if you go to Legendary Marines website, up at the top, there's a little tab that takes you to was it About Us or what is the tab that you can find it? Uh, under About Us Fishing Seminar. It says Under About Us. So it talks about our, our dealership and our company. And then you can look at the fishing seminars. So you can always pull that up at legendarymarine.com. Um, so I'm Todd Royal, and this is Mark Holtz. And our friendship bonded back four years ago when Mark came in and bought his boat that he didn't even realize he was going to end up chartering at the time, but yeah. then, then started chartering and just became really, really good friends. So it just means a lot that the final seminar of the 2021 season, which has been probably the most unique season that we've ever had to deal with up here at the fishing seminars. So very special. So nice. th thank, thank you. you for coming. No, thank you for selling me a boat. Well, <laughs> that, was, that was mostly Travis. It's funny, just a quick story. How, how random is it that two brothers, Todd and Travis, from Jacksonville, Florida, Florida, end up in Warren, Vermont for a week together to fish and play golf? And so he comes in with a sugar loaf hat on, which is the closest ski and tennis resort. It's a big tennis resort too, right? All, obviously a lot of indoor tennis there. And uh, we're like, the hat, the deal. And he's like, oh, Vermont did, it, did the whole deal ski. So that's how yeah, we really started hitting it off. a deal on a boat. <laughs> yep. So he was outside. He, he was outside with Kayla. And they were parked in our, our uh, customer parking. And he had one of those bike racks. Obviously, he likes adventure, has a bike rack. And he took it off of his car to put something in the back. No, I wanted to make sure I, my car would tow the Oh, boat. that's right. And someone stole his. And, and yeah, my bike rack bike wasn't rack. there when the I got it. first back. day I took delivery. Oh, that's too bad. It's awesome. No, we found it, a guy. It was, it was great. So we went straight into PI mode and, and just Put went, on, him, went on to, to the, camera on the cameras. And, and, and that was that. So. Kayla made me stay in the car when we went to get my bike rack back. So thank after, you. After that, many concerts and events and beach days and friendship. So here, here you are. It seems like it was yesterday. Where's your belt buckle? I don't have it on. Why? That was last year. So Mark, so three years later, Mark wins the, the fishing rodeo captain of the year, 25 and under. So he has his belt buckle, and he just came in second place this season. Yep. And he says it's because he just didn't have a ton of people to fish with him. He couldn't run a bunch of charters and take a bunch of anglers. So yep. next year, he needs help, seasoned help. Okay. It's, it's pretty hard to pull in a 50-pound amberjack if you're not used to it sometimes. So. So, and so typically, Mark and Tim, you guys know Tim from Half Fish Tackle, they typically do the offshore stuff and I handle the inshore stuff. And there's a significant difference between, we'll, we'll go ahead and start getting into the fishing, between the spring inshore seminars and the fall inshore seminar. Um, there, this year, surprisingly, it's still this warm. I don't remember it being this hot consecutive days. Um, to where you're going to go back and you're going to see high 70s, early, low 80s, and places like Hogtown Bayou. And still true flat fishing is as hot as it is, if not better than all summer long. Uh, Captain Blake and his team keep their boats here, and they strictly run inshore charters. And so it's mostly redfish and trout. And in the last month, I have looked at the fish station and seen the fish they've hung up probably three times as much fish with a lot better weight. So as hot as it was all summer long, and although there were some good fish to catch, they weren't as, they weren't as thick on the flats as they are right now, and they're starting to get. So we'll talk about inshore fall flats fishing. We'll talk about wintertime flats fishing, which is a lot of sight fishing and lower, clearer water conditions. So you get really spooky fish. And then we'll also talk about the the big bulls that chase around the bait in the bay and that start to congregate once it stays good and cold and steady and they start to congregate around the bottom of the water column around the bridge, bridge pylons. And we'll talk about the tackle, the line, the hooks, the rods, the reels, the gear, everything you need. 
So, sound good? Yeah. And Mark's going to help guide me to where I don't get off track <laughs> and ask me simple questions. But please feel free if you have a question and it's technical as you want to get, that's fine. If it's just simple and basic, ask the question because no one taught me how to fish here in Destin. I've lived here. This I just celebrated my 18th anniversary here at Legendary. I just did it on my own. So I just figured out which hooks work, which hooks don't, which hooks are great live bait hooks on the Mid-Bay Bridge, which ones are better on the flats, what numbers, and all that good stuff. And I'm wearing a very lucky jersey tonight. We got the Braves playing. So we're going to shoot through this like I'm just kidding. <laughs> so don't ask too many questions because they, they start in an hour. So, but we got to go Braves tonight. Keep, keep it here, okay? I am not. I wish I was. I'd probably get nervous and fall down. Um, I'll tell you what, if you'll pick up the other side of the table so we stay in front of the camera, yeah. just, we'll just kind of take it over closer to the camera. A little bit closer. And then we can start talking about So I always like to talk about the necessities of, a, of my tackle box. My tackle box and Mark's tackle box are completely different. I promise you. Yeah. Completely different. Oh. He is a psycho about everything. I have rusty hooks in here from 10 years ago, <laughs> but he does it for a living and I do it for recreation. But they probably work just as well. I always tell people this the number one thing that you can have in your tackle box is paper towels for obvious reasons. When that early morning coffee hits you and you're stuck out on the flats, <laughs> this is the best thing. And there's not a whole lot of really good head systems on. 20 and 22 foot bay boats. So this is the most, I mean, I seriously will turn back around if I think that I have left this for any reason. And that was also prior to having nice microfiber towels. So this also works <laughs> nice in your hand or wipes down a windshield, but most importantly, wipes down you know what. All right, so another couple of very important things. First and foremost, these. Very good, high quality, and I prefer, I prefer, the glass lens are a little bit heavier, but um, Costa Del Mar, Smith's, Maui Gems, any of the, those really good brands because a lot of what we do is in shallow water and you want to see what you're doing. It, it's funny when, I mean, I'm on the water every day, so I'm staring at the water and I see things and people on my boat are like, how did you see that? And I'm like, what do you mean? You can't see that right there? <clears throat> and then I'm like, try my sunglasses and everyone's like, and Kayla knows this as well as I do. I feel like more people get off my boat and go buy sunglasses. It, yeah. And, so, and the thing is, is not every pair is right, right? You I mean, you can get some good fashion glasses that have a lot of open exposure here where the sun's constantly. And the wind. And the wind. So just out of, just being out of nature, you're typically going to fish and look away from the sun. Typically, especially if you're sight fishing, you want that sun to your back. You don't want to stare into the sun when you're cobia fishing. I mean, I know charter boats that do it. They'll, they'll get up and they'll, they'll run down the sandbar real slow and they're staring directly into that seven and eight o'clock sun. And I don't know how they see fish. I'd much rather have that sun in my back to help me see. Is, but is there a color lens you like better than another? There is. Um, when I'm fishing in offshore, like an offshore condition, deeper water, I like something like a cobalt blue. If I'm fishing in shallow water, I like an amber, like uh, an amber. And the theory is the more mirror that you have, the more of that glare you're gonna knock down. Your, your typical amber lens has a green mirror. Your typical gray or darker lens has a blue mirror. Okay. <laughs> and we can move the yeah. table this way. So now we're all in the picture. Uh, I'm going to come back. Can you see me, Matt? Yeah. All right. So, but the point I was getting to is if you have a lot of exposure and that sun's coming in, you just naturally want to look away from the sun. What happens to the sun? It reflects off the inside of your glasses. It's not good for your eyes, but it's more of an eyesore than anything, right? Two ways to prevent that is get a pair of glasses that fit your head and that are structured or wear one of these neck gaiters. So these are good, not only for sun, but you put them 
right around your glasses and over your over your hat and it'll knock all that down. So that's going to prevent. So when you're cobia fishing early in the morning and you got the sun to your back, you're not getting this. And I mean, obviously you want to be able to see in all directions. The other big kicker is you don't want to wear a hat or wear one of these that are light in color because the sun reflects off of those lighter colors. You want dark. You ever seen baseball players or football players put that dark under their eyes because it knocks down the glare. Thanks. Yeah. Nice hat. Yeah. And you see, I was just thinking about this the other day. I was on the water. You see how the underside of this bill is navy? So we have them in black and we have them in white as well. And it's just, it's night and day difference. The amount of fish that you'll see if you have darker color clothes on. You see guys, novice guys that'll go out and stand up in a tower with a bright white shirt on or like a, a, a really light green or something pastel blue. All you're doing is picking up that color because in Mark's boat, he's got a really bright white gel coat and that's what he's gonna pick up if he doesn't have something dark. So when you see these veterans fishing in these Cobia tournaments and there's four of them up in a tower, look at the color of their uh, hoodies they're all wearing. Most of them are camouflage or black and that's for that reason. So very important. This is something that the older we get, the more useful and we start to think about our skin and the protection <laughs> of our skin. So these are, these are Hook. This is the Hook brand and it's super lightweight. You're not going to sweat to death, but it has enough coverage to where your sleeve can go over the top. And just think when you're fishing all the time, well, you have to have, you feel for your fingertips. So you want to be able to feel the line and the rod and all that, regardless of what side you're fishing with, your fingers are never exposed because you're either have your fingers around the, the reel itself, or you have tying your hands knots. around the rod or you're tying knots, but that part's never exposed. That's why you have that for feel. And then the inside's got a little grip too, which is nice if you are grabbing fish by the tail or picking them up at all. And if you don't want your hands to look like mine, by these. Wear some. A couple other things that are necessity, always keep one of these. You never know when that one morning that you're going to get ate up and then you're a ways away from the boat ramp once you stop. Especially in the bay. Especially in the bay, especially back in places like Hogtown Bayou. Um, I've always kept one of these and I know it's rusty, but that doesn't really matter. This is a hook sharpener. I can't tell you how many times you go to pick a hook up out and you just feel that, hey, this thing's not nearly as sharp as it should be. It takes two seconds just to, or you can also um, take the barb off your hook very easily, either that or with pliers. Two things, when it comes to the pliers, and this is all mostly inshore when you got like a finer, more delicate, uh, fluorocarbon or a braid, always keep a pair of pliers. Now, some people may use really nice expensive pliers and keep them hooked to their pants, okay? I don't like them hooked to my pants just because it seems like when I'm working a rod, the, the butt of the rod always gets caught up and that piece is dangling and it's always in the way. So I always go, this is called Crook and this is a brand that Half Hitch has had for a long time and they're super inexpensive. I think they're $15 or something like that. And these things typically last for about four or five years. And I put them through all kinds of trouble. Put them in salt water. They, I, they just bounce around all the time, but I just keep them in my pocket. When I'm fishing, I have it in the back pocket or my side pocket. And you know what, worst case scenario, I drop a pair of $15 pliers in the water, but I'll just go buy another pair. I just don't like the, the piece hanging off are you that way? Oh, I've, I have mine on my, so I actually have a belt because a lot, I don't like the belt clips or anything like that. I have a pair of, there may be $400 pliers that I take with me. Mm -hmm. I leave them on a, their own belt that, and I like them on their own belt because if they're in the way when I'm reeling, I'll swing them around and have them in the back. Okay. But the last thing I want is to try to, because I've normally got kids on my mm -hmm. boat or somebody worried about something. So I like to have those things there that I mean, they're strong enough. I could break a hook off of a grouper or something if I needed to. Yeah. So I'm, I'm the opposite. I'm a expensive plier, but I like my toys. Um, but I'm an expensive plier on me, no matter what. Like I feel like I forgot pants if I don't have pliers clipped onto my belt somewhere. Well, there you go. The polar opposite. Imagine that. He does it for a living though, and I do it recreationally. Um, just as important, if not more, I probably have, I have one of those in my box, maybe two all the time. 
and I always have seven or eight of these. These are fingernail clippers. And fingernail clippers, when you are dealing with light braid, like I like to fish, 15 or 20 pound braid, this is what cuts. And I, we talk about the different knots where you connect the fluorocarbon to the braid. I fish an Albright knot, and that's a very clean knot. And the tags you can get in real tight, but you, the problem is you can't get in real tight with light braid with most of these pliers. So that's why I always have this. And it's, it's just easy, it stays in your pocket and when you're, when you're hooking back up. I know this is small and it's simple and it's probably off a centimeter or two, but just keep one of these spare in your tackle box at all times. It's just a measuring stick. It's real simple. And that would be one yard. So always keep that. I like Boga grips. You guys ever use those? Okay, so yes, you sh there is a time and a place, to, especially inshore fishing. So inshore fishing, you don't typically use a gaff, and a lot of people fish by themselves when they're inshore. And the boga grip's nice just to keep hooked on the T-top or somewhere on, on the boat or just keep it in your tackle box. So I, I still think everybody should have a decent landing net. I just didn't have it with me because it's in my boat. Um, the other thing you should have is a boga grip. So one month ago, I'm by myself, I got a two hour window, and I just want to go fish an old flat. That's not far from here at all, and I'm throwing a top water, and I know I can catch more fish if I throw a suspended jerk bait or something like that, but I just want a good top water bite. So after about 12 trout up to two pounds, I'm like, I'm just, I'm tired of these small trout, I just want a decent redfish. So I move down the flats, and I don't have my landing net, I have this in the boat, which was fine, because I end up hooking up with this, I mean, a, a, at least a 35 pound redfish, and I'm catching it on a little casting rod, like a bass rod, which I'll show you in a minute. Once I tired the fish out after 25 minutes, I just grabbed it under the gill. But then when I went to go release it, I wanted to put this around its lip so I could drag it through the water and the swivels. It's so much easier to do this than try to take your thumb and do it, because your, your wrist obviously doesn't swivel. This way your hand can move upside down, the fish isn't gonna flip over on you. And this is a great way to, to revive a fish. And then if, as long as it's either on a float or that's it's a, wrapped around your wrist. So I was gonna say, those things sink. Yeah, so that's why it's, you know, most people use a float that fish a lot. When I back when I fished a lot, I used a float, but I just don't these days. What am I missing in terms of necessities that make a travel tackle box worthwhile? I use a little hand gaff for just about everything because if especially flats fishing now I feel like you're ultimately going to run into a catfish yeah and the last thing I want to do is mess around unhooking a catfish so the, Tim's little hand gaffs the little mm -hmm. 16 inch hand gaffs that they sell at half inch are just perfect for unhooking a fish we have some here up we got one in my office I'll bring it up here and show it to you that's a that's a great point uh, anything else in terms of necessity Sunblock, obviously. Yeah, sunblock, a lot of hooks, um, pliers for sure, the net, leader, split shots. Yep. <laughs> uh, yep. To hand towels. Hand towels. <laughs> Another good one. We all have those now. Any questions about other, any necessities on your boat? Okay. Uh, trolling motor and power pole. Trolling motor, power pole, all good stuff. We'll get to that in just a second. So let's talk about early fall, late fall, early winter flats fishing, okay? So typically, there you go, Miss Kayla's got them here. So this is one of our little D hookers. Yeah. And this is a gaff, little 16 inch gaff and a little nine inch D hooker. And Mark can kind of tell you how these two work together or I so. use I use both of these about as much as I can offshore I use these a lot and it's probably a little inhumane if we're not going to keep the fish but if it's I'm not going to stick my hand in a groupers or a king or any any kind of offshore fish's mouth but uh, if I can kind of control them a little bit with a hook here lift them up let people take pictures with them and let them go that way I'm not putting my hands all over that fish anyway and taking his slime off and all that but for unhooking a fish either of these it's funny now and you know, when people get on my boat, the more fish we hook, I'm like, I'm not touching that. 
you should see my hands. I get enough hooks and cuts and scrapes from, from these fish, but just to grab that leader, slide it down and flip the fish off is, I, yeah, I have. And especially during snapper season and when the fish are really biting and if I've got four people on my boat, I do. I have one of these on every corner of my T-top. So, and, and people are like, why do you have so many gaffs? I'm like, just, just wait. And when we start fishing and we have a quadruple hookup on snappers, yeah, this is going right in my pocket. Yeah. yeah. So you can get, and all, Tim has these made at half inch tackle so you can get those very easily. These float. <laughs> they do float. You know what they're made out of, don't you? <laughs> Broomsticks. So you can go get a broomstick at Home Depot and make you about six of them out of it. Um, LSU ones float better than Alabama in the truck. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, so the next thing I want to talk about is the, the rods, the reels, and the tackle, the line, uh, the knots, and things of that nature. So we're going to slide down here. These are the four rods and reels that I have on my boat pretty much at all, all time. If I'm, if I'm just walking down to the dock to catch a redfish or two, I will. Um, start with this. So this is a casting rod, like a bait caster, very similar to what most of you guys grew up fishing with. Back in the day, they were a little bigger and beefier. They had some smaller stuff, but this is the technology behind these this day. These days is unbelievable. This is so lightweight. This is what I caught that 35 pound redfish on last month. And the drag solid, it's smooth, but it's got a little computer chip in it, a little chip in it that once it starts to backlash and it senses that, it slows that, that release down. So it helps a lot. It's not foolproof at all because I still throw backlashes with it. And Bill can attest, <clears throat> Sam bought one and she doesn't have it any longer. But it's, I mean, I spent my whole life throwing them. So it's just, they, they work, they help. But I can work a topwater plug just because I grew up doing it so much more natural with my left hand working it this way. One, I have a lot less reel in my hand, or a lot, a lot more reel in my hand, and I can just, I can work it better with my pointer finger than I can a spinning rod. I still can work it good with a spinning rod. Um, and then I can, I can retrieve it quicker. This is a much quicker ratio typically than spinning reels. And it's really, really lightweight. Just a lot of fun. This is a G Loomis and a Shimano. But I'm gonna pass these around just be careful because they have treble hooks hooked up to them. But you can kind of feel the weight. There's a lot of that weight in the, in, the, uh, in the lure. So my next favorite little ultralight baby is this would be the version of that ultralight casting rod in a spinning setup. So um, Shimano makes these Stratix reels. This is the, the CI4 Plus. So... This has been out, this is the newer version. These have been out for about 10 years. This was the first really lightweight reel. The problem is that you always wanna make sure is that if you're fishing a lightweight reel, you wanna fish a lightweight rod. So you don't wanna go buy this rod or this reel and say, well, I've spent most of my money and then go buy a seven foot ugly stick. There's, then, then the weight's not gonna be dialed in. So. You want a good lightweight rod, still to this day, I think, pound for pound when you're fishing inshore, the very best rod that you can buy is a star rod. And, and especially for the money. If you think about things that we skimp on, the things we don't want to skimp on is our reel, our rod, and our line. I and, promise you. And a warranty. And a warranty. So um, you probably would use that more than I would because he just fishes more days in a year. But this is a, a nice, this is a medium light action setup. And the difference between this rod and one that I'm going to pass around in a minute is this one has so much play in the rod tip. You know what that's really good for? Trout fishing. So when you're working artificials back, one, you don't want big, heavy-weighted hooks. A trout, the second it eats, what's it going to do? Shake its head. And if it has a heavy weight in it, heavy-weighted hook or a lure, or if it has a rod that doesn't have any give, then nine times out of ten, it's going to, it's going to shake the bait. So this you will see that it's got really small um, hooks. It's a very lightweight lure, and the rod and reel itself is very light. Next up, it's still considered light to me, 
but this is kind of the next step up to a medium not quite a medium heavy but this has got a little more backbone which will allow me to throw a heavier bait further so you can see that it doesn't bend as easy at the at the at the tip and it's got a lot more backbone in it which you'll feel but it's still i'm telling you crazy light compared to what i've fished in the past and this is the same exact reel making model and it's almost the identical weight to the ounce the only difference is the smaller rod that i'm going to be catching smaller fish with and not working around docks because this i want to be able to get fish away from structure that i can use a smaller reel so that's a 2500 series this is the same exact reel same gears but it's got a bigger spool this is a 3000 series that, and that rod with a stratic on it is what i use for mm -hmm. all of my fishing whether it's catching redfish in the bay or king mackerel offshore that's my king mackerel rod <laughs> and i don't know why people more people don't use it so this one is a full medium heavy action rod that's got it's a lot heavier not a lot heavier it's a couple ounces heavier the reel is a, a, a good bit bigger it's a 4000 series reel and this is what i want to keep on the boat in case i see uh schooling redfish or i see schooling jacks but this is what i vertical jig with on the mid-bay bridge that one that i'm passing around with is can get the job done this one can just get it done a lot better feel that one yeah. that one's got some some butt to it and so those are the four rods that I fish inshore with. Those are the four rods that I take on the flats boat every single time. And every single one has a different application. You'll see one, this one has a, a grub on it with a little eight ounce size jig head, super lightweight for fishing the flats, but fishing around docks, okay? So if I wanna go down in the middle of the day and just catch one or two redfish off the dock, just to clear my mind, I wanna take that rod because I'm gonna have to work fish up out of the dock. So that's why I take that bigger rod. A similar rod to that is what my personal one, regardless of charters, if I'm walking the beach, casting to anything cruising by, especially yes. kings, I've, and I've caught king mackerel off the beach with, with that rod very similar to that. But that, if I had to buy one rod, one combo for inshore, mm -hmm. lighter offshore stuff, walking the beach, walking anywhere, a rod like that is what I would have to take. So that rod you can fish in all surf conditions if you're pompano fishing. I mean, you don't want to fish when it's insanely rough and you're not gonna be able to keep a jig, but there's a major difference in fishing a, a small jig and then being able to fish a heavier jig in a little bit rougher conditions where you've got good rip tides and the, and the water's moving you know, side to side. So. Like what Mark said, that, that rod can take a, a, light, a light bait and a heavy bait and throw it a long way. Especially like a metal, you can throw a metal to the back sandbar with a rod like that. Yep. So those are the rods, those are the reels. Let's talk about the line, okay? I am fishing in, I'm fishing the beach, sight fishing for redfish in the winter. I'm fishing here on the docks. I'm fishing around docks on the bay. Uh, fishing open flats and I'm fishing this bridge a lot and that is on the only thing I'll take the other two larger rods over here they're just simple universal rods that you can buy at half inch and that's what I'm doing when I'm just focusing on bull reds or if I'm catching big sheep's head in the middle of the winter I'm using something with a lot more backbone to it but you good with those so let's talk about the line I fish either a 15 or a 20 pound braid and there is a major difference between the original power pro and then what is now considered the super slick or there's a couple of other newer versions that isn't nearly as kinky and waxy as the original power pro if i was a charter boat captain and i wanted something coarse and something that was going to stick through a month or two at a time i probably would just use the original power pro if i was doing a lot of live bait stuff but I'm not. I very rarely fish with live bait unless I have my little girls on the boat. And then I'll take split shots, little number two underhooks, and just simple corks and just go catch fish around the docks. So I'm fishing. Remember, this is very important. You want super slick. 
You can feel everything on your fingertips. You can feel everything in the palm of your hand. And then I'm fishing, if I'm fishing inshore in the winter, even, even possibly pompano fishing and running down the beach in those clear conditions, I'm fishing a 15 pound fluorocarbon braid or a four, four carbon liter. So I've got 15 and 20 in the box of both the, the braid and the fluorocarbon. You cannot imagine the difference between 15 pound braid and 20 pound braid. It is night and day difference. So the two bigger reels, I have the 20, the two lighter reels, I have the 15. S same thing with the, the leader. I've got 15 on that, on the smaller stuff, and I got 20 on the bigger stuff. You can't imagine the difference between that as well. How long a shock line or leader line do you put on it? So I am different. So I see a lot of fishermen fish with a uni knot that's maybe got 18 inches, okay? I like to play it safe. One, I'm lazy. I think everybody is when they get on a boat. And if you're throwing an Albright knot, this is a knot that's going to last for a while because the tag end faces back at, at the rod when you're reeling it in. So it's not picking up a lot of trash in the water. And it's, even though when it's leaving the rod, it's really almost like aerodynamic. It's almost like a little bullet. It's not clunky and it has these big tags and it just, it's not un unorthodox. So I will go ahead and tie it. Bill, you can see from my hands, that's probably a good yard. I'm always probably 36 to 40 inches, and then I can typically go through without anything abnormal, I can go through six or seven baits at least. Now, if I'm fishing with baits like this and I'm on the flats and the flats are clear, I, and I know I'm gonna be fishing suspended baits, you know, like little miradines, something light and small that fish can see very well in clear water, then I'll go ahead and retie a leader. But if this is a topwater rod and I've gone through two or three reties and I've only got probably a foot and a half to two feet left, I'll still throw that topwater plug because, I mean, the, the fish are focusing on the bait. It's more of a reaction strike than it is finesse, right? But you, when, when you see me fish these flats in the winter, I've almost got five foot of leader. And, and if I'm throwing artificials, it's really light Will it really either bright or clear baits and it's leading the fish way out in front and letting it sit, sit, sit. Because I've, I mean, I've, I've tried to catch pompano throwing live baits up and down the beach and no matter how light I went, no matter how long of a leader I went, they, they, they could still see the braid. So I just, I didn't catch fish that day. Not to open a can of worms, but how do you feel about uh, like a speed clip in front of your lure? <laughs> yeah, I'm not a fan. Um, I don't like a whole lot of that for sure. And I know the novice fishermen will, will they'll go and they'll use it because it's easy to take baits on and off. I just, I'm a lot more technical than that. So I'm not a fan. How do you feel about it? I'm a it? huge fan of speed clips. <laughs> not I me. love those things. Is that same thing as a snap swivel? It's similar. A snap swivel, not so much because it's not aerodynamic and it, and it, I, I would typically use a, I would only use a snap swivel back in my younger days on spoons, okay? Because I just didn't want the spoon to sit there and twist the line up. But I don't want to use a snap swivel anywhere ever, any of the time. So what is that gizmo? I, and I, I can show you one afterwards. Um, you can show them at your own seminar. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I change, I use the same rods for just about everything. And for me, I mean, you know, I cruise the whole bay in the mornings and then I run offshore. I use that same rod inshore and offshore. If I come across bulls or jacks or anything, I'll throw one lure. And then as soon as I go offshore, I'll clip that lure right off and put a new one on and clip that on and throw it right back out offshore. So I think it's, I, uh, we've caught a lot of fish on them, uh, but I'll, I'll show you after. Just remember though, he's not throwing He's not throwing lightweight rods with lightweight baits and, 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 and bringing his artificial lures all the way almost to the top of his rod to make casts. So that thing still has to run through, you know, a guide um, and still can create. Oh, uh, no, I mean, right oh, here. Oh, you're talking about rounded yeah, bait. Right here, right here. Okay, yeah. Yeah, like a little one right there. Still, just still garbage. <laughs> <laughs> We're old school. We like to tie knots around here. Um, I don't. I know. Uh, so, 
so we got the line, we've got the fluorocarbon. I want to talk about that Albright knot because most of what I do is in, on the flats. So a uni to uni knot is pulled two ways. It's got tag ends coming off of both ends. The problem is, is when you're retrieving your line, the tag end on that uni knot is facing back at the rod tip. So if I'm throwing spoons, like a quarter ounce spoon, in very light, I mean shallow conditions, for redfish in the winter and I'm running it through grass, that knot picks up more crap than you can imagine if you're not throwing an Albright. This Albright knot has the tag facing back at the bait. So you're, you're just not gonna pick it up. That's as simple as that. And if you, wanna, if you wanna learn how to tie an Albright, I'd love to show you, but you can hit rewind and play on YouTube all day long and learn it. And there'll be a way that you learn it yourself to where you're using the right hand with the with the right side and you'll figure it all out. Just I'd go to YouTube because I'm left-handed and a lot of the things, I'm ambidextrous, so I do a lot of things differently than most people. And an Albright you can tie in a matter of seconds. Yep. Yeah, that's the same knot we use for everything. And if you tie them right, they're super strong. If you, if you mistie them, they can not be that way. So we're still on the flats, all right? There's, in the winter time, it's not as bad. There's not a lot of dead grass floating around the bay once it starts to get cold because there's not a lot of the grass growing out of the flats and there's not a lot of southerly winds to make that grass die off and blow to the, all across the bay. So you can get away in the wintertime with um, some treble hook style baits. And these are the ones, these are my favorite. There's a ton of different colors obviously. But for trouts and reds and open flats conditions, in most cases, I like to throw these little mirror lure mirrodines, okay? Either that or something small, like a Ketch Junior. They make a Ketch 2000 that looks like a mullet, or they make a Ketch Junior, which is a smaller finger mullet. But there's something about this, but you just don't see a lot of finger mullet on the flats here. But you do see a lot of small pinfish and, and little baits that look like this, that mimic this. And it's a twitch bait, so you throw it out, it starts to sink slow, and you can work it quick, or you, or you can work it slow. Um, and it's supposed to look like an injured fish that's just not acting completely normal. And it's more of a reaction bait. And the smaller hooks are really good for trout. Um, and then I like to use that lighter rod. So the other two baits I like to use in the wintertime is just a simple jig head with a grub. And some people like a curly tail grub, some people like a flat paddle tail grub. I like a swim tail grub. And if I'm throwing a swim tail grub, I don't want to use, especially when the water's low and I don't have a lot of real estate to work with, if I've only got 18 inches of water column because I've got six inches of grass in the winter and I'm fishing in shallow water, if I use something like a Coty jig head that's aerodynamic, almost like an arrowhead, where it's thin and it's pointed, I can take the same weighted jig head and I can keep this in the water column at a slower retrieve to where it's natural. One, you have the resistance of the round jig head, big key here, round jig head, and then you also have the paddle tail. So both of these are working as resistance in the water to where you can work it slower and more natural. And in the wintertime, you want to work it slower and more natural than you do and speed it up in the summertime. But you can take this same bait and the same exact size, weighted jig head and that pointy jig head, and you have to work the bait three times faster to keep it off the grass, off the bottom, just on a regular retrieve. And in the wintertime, I don't like a lot of twitching and doing all that. It's either sitting in the, it's sitting in the sand pocket or it's a very slow retrieve right across the top of the grass. But this is very important. There's not, not a lot of people focus on that, but that round jig head is the resistance. I like Z-Man's new, the Elaztec ones that oh, they yeah. came out with. The buoyancy on them, the, the plastic is it almost floats. Mm -hmm. So you, get, you can get by with a much heavier jig head that you can throw a lot farther because the plastic itself will keep it from sinking too fast. So and I they really last a lot longer. Exactly. Yeah, I really like those new <clears throat> paddle tails. Those, and that's, the, that's a smaller version of the same head. So I think that's an eighth ounce. This is probably a 16th ounce. So when the water's really skinny. And this is a more solid rubber bait, but it's the DOA cow baits. 
and they are typically a little bit smaller than the normal jig head. That one's a little sticky because it's got some special juice on it. That special juice, I almost forgot to show you guys. I talk about this time. Every, every single time, if you had to have one universal stench on your bait, that would cover shrimp, it would cover crab, it would cover mullet, menhaden, everything. This is the one. So this is called Procure Inshore Saltwater, and it's just a universal super gel. And I, I can tell you, the years that I didn't fish with it, I <clears throat> noticeably less strikes, especially with topwater plugs. So yes, topwater plugging is a, it's a reactive strike, but how many times does a redfish follow your bait for a while and then nose at it and swing at it? They do the nose and then the swing and a whole lot less if they have this on it. They hammer it. So it sticks, it sticks obviously beyond the day on your bait. Plastic, soft plastics, it stays for days. You can take one swipe of it on the back of a topwater plug and you can fish with it for eight hours and go take your fingers and you can still feel it and smell it. It's, if you want a hit of that, just open it up and take your plug. So you suggest eating your sandwich before you bait your hook? Yes. Um, but really good stuff. The other bait I like on the flats, and I, I got two examples of what to do and what not to do. So typically north winds push the water out of the bay, so I'm fishing in really shallow water and really clear water. So I'm throwing a quarter ounce. And this is just a universal Johnson spoon. I don't think it can get any better. So this is stuff that works all the time. And when I put it on the spoon, I always put it on the inside of the spoon. That I put on the inside. So then when it's rubbing around the outside, when it's coming back through the grass, it doesn't knock off. You'll see two examples here. You'll see one with a snap swivel, which is easy and convenient. The, the point is, is the bait can work through the water and not twist your line if you ever try to work a spoon at any speed at all, other than just a slow roll, by the third or fourth cast, you're gonna end up throwing wind knots and you're gonna see how tangled your line is, okay? There's two setups here. You got a snap swivel, which is a major no-no, because one, they're weak, they're cheaply made, and most snap swivels have a little barb that sticks out. That doesn't work well. And then you'll see the weed guard here. You always wanna keep the weed guard just above the hook. This is the correct way to do it. So this is a split ring and a good swivel, lightweight swivel. Remember, we don't want a big massive swivel on a quarter ounce bait. So in the summertime, I fish half ounce baits a lot because I got a lot more water and I can work it a little bit faster. So you can kind of see the difference in those two. I used to come to these seminars when I moved down here on that side. And that's probably the one, my favorite piece of advice that I got from you. And regardless of everything else that yeah. we've talked about, this right here. So it's, and it's because they're smaller baits and the split rings are smaller. So you, you, does everybody know what a split ring is? So when you buy, I'll show you the, I'll show you this too. God, I got a lot of pro cure. I can smell so it. So some baits just have a normal eyelet, okay, right here. Some baits have that and an additional split ring. So you don't have, you can tie your traditional knot and you don't have to tie a loop knot. What this allows the bait to do is work more naturally and have more play because you don't have the tension of a tight knot. If you have the tension of a tight knot around this bait, it's not gonna work as fluently in the water and have as much play because it's just tight. It's got a tight line around it. So you can, you can tie a loop knot or you can do a split ring. So on a weedless hook, you take a split ring and you connect it to the bait, okay? And then you go back in that split ring with, they have special pliers for this, or you can just take another hook off another bait and just fire a couple of these across the room and get ticked off and, and it's <laughs> awesome. And then you take a little swivel and you put it on the top, so that would allow that bait to move. Because then you wouldn't spend money. I promise you. I know, and there are baits that have it and there are baits that don't have it. So, um, prime example. Split ring pliers are worth it. I... So here is 
So this is the way these lures come out of the box. This is a mirror lure top dog junior, no split ring. And this is a bomber, what are these called? Badonka donk, okay? I can't but believe you forgot that. You see, you see the split ring? I know it's hard. I know, Bill, I know you can't see it. I know, I can see it. Dr. Rain's not here, so you don't have to lie. <laughs> so, um, so this plug, because of the shape, this is more of a football. This is more heavily weighted at the front end and has a smaller tail end. This bait wants to do this more than just this, okay? This bait has a lot more action if you allow it less resistance like it has coming out of the box. So a split ring. And if, if you still have questions about the split ring, you can come up afterwards and I'll show you the difference. Same thing with like uh, Rapala's and little swim baits. So these little swim baits, you know, with the lip that swim under the water, this one maybe, maybe swims a foot under the water. Some with a longer lip obviously dive deeper. But if you tie, have you ever trolled for bull reds and you look back and you see a lot of that? Now that's gonna come also with some of the cheap, cheaper made non-consistent plugs. But a lot of the good ones like these Yozuri's, they'll come with a split ring on it. That split ring gives it the resistance to where you can troll it slow or you can troll it fast and it'll still have the same play. Is that right? Yeah. And I, I mean, a nice quick disconnect on the front of this acts like a great loop knot <coughs> also. You save that for your seminar. Um, so that's flats, flats fishing under the water. Very rarely do I take a top water out in the, in the middle of the winter. It happens when I see striking fish on top of the water, but that's out in deep water. So when you have these baits, okay, if you're working shallow, you're working slow, and a lot of the times the fish will see you before you see them. So if you want to put yourself through the stresses that I do and still try to catch them on artificial, you can do that, but you're catching one out of every five fish that you would catch on live bait. If you're fishing in the flats, you have a lot less grass in the winter. So I would take something like uh, one of the baits I just passed around, the smaller jig head, or the real small jig head. I would find an open sandy circle. I'd throw to the back side of it, let it land in the sand. I'm away from the grass and I'd work it slow, just real slow off the bottom. A lot of times, if you haven't already seen the fish, which in the wintertime, they usually see you first, then you'll see that fish dart and pick it up. Um, and then you can just let it sit. Once they dart and you don't fill them eat it, just let it sit there for a second and then just barely tap that rod tip. You got some good procure on it, they'll hit it pretty hard. And I noticed a major difference in the wintertime, just real quick for sight fishing for redfish. <clears throat> All the plastic baits in the world, nothing gets hammered like a crab. So you know how uh, DOA makes those little smaller crabs? You could, same, same thing, you, can, you could work it. They're weighted, some of them are. Some, some companies make them where you can just put them on a jig head, but a redfish hammers a crustacean a lot harder than it does, obviously, because it's got a hard shell, than a little shrimp or a, a bait fish. So just food for thought in the, sun, in, the, in the winter time, instead of throwing something like this, throw one of those little crabs, just hook it up with that Procure. That's the other bait that I use a lot in the winter is a DOA shrimp. I use a lightweight, typically in lighter waters, I use a lighter color, like the almost clear with a chartreuse tail, or just almost like that gold color. Um, not the bronze color, but just, just something light, like really clear and light. Uh, that would almost be too dark. But this is the size I like to throw around the flats in the wintertime. That really light. Oh, there they are. Same weight, but just obviously different, different color. What, what do you think about gulp? Love gulp. I love gulp. What do you think about gulp? I love gulp. We've had days where gulp has outfished live bait. Oh yeah. And gulp, gulp's good. I just, for me, that's, that's just a lot it. to go through. Um, and and I, I may only fish for 30 minutes sometimes. So gulp's very expensive. There's only like five or six to a pack typically. And then by, when you take it off, you can put it back in the pack. You can reuse them a few times, but for me, I just prefer using the Procure because it still has that scent, you know what I mean? Yep. Um, I love the gulp, especially in the deep jigging like we're gonna go over in a minute, but 
Um, any questions about the, in, the inshore shallow water stuff? How do you find a fish? Where do you know where to catch? <clears throat> so you look, for, you look for some structure. So anytime in the, in the winter around these docks, if you have any kind of little drop-offs at all, at all, it could be five inches in an area that's about the size of that boat or greater. So you can find that around... You can just go in open flats and see where it gets a little bit darker than it is on the rest of the flats. Like, not far from here, there's a massive, massive hole that's about the size of half the shell room. <clears throat> and every single year I've ever pulled up to it in a boat and just snuck up on it and push pulled up to it, you see massive trout. And they just stay. And there's just something about, one, it's deeper, it's darker, it's got more of a silty bottom than it does on the, the lighter, uh, gr you know, just the sand flats. Um, or I just look in sand. I look in sand pockets. And I love, my favorite time to fish in the winter is from 10 to 2. That is, that is my favorite four hours to fish. One, it's warmer, but two, it's brighter and you can see. So I can't tell you how many times I've fished at, from 8 to noon and realized I passed up hundreds of fish that I never saw. And so I got up on them, I spooked them away, and I didn't have time to catch them. Um, or I didn't set up to catch them the right way. And that's, that's another thing that comes into play. You gotta have the right kind of trolling motor. You can't kick it up, you can't cavitate, you can't make a bunch of bubbles and sound. And any, any type of power pole is unbelievable. Whether it's just the little six footer, the 10 foot blade, or even the one that I have on my John boat that you just manually stick down. Because once you are in the fish, you gotta be quiet, you can't throw out an anchor, you can't make a bunch of noise and that stuff is priceless. Yeah, especially on the flats, I think the power pole. I'm, for me, I normally have a lot of people on my boat, so it's a little different than, than what you're talking about, but when, I, when you put your trolling motor down, you obviously go bow to current or wind or whatever, so it kind of limits deck space. I've, on my boat, everybody ends up fishing off the back. We're facing this way. The people's baits are drifting behind us. Everybody's jammed into the back, but when I put my power pole down and I swing stern to the current or the wind or whatever is dictating our direction. It forces everybody up on the front of my boat. And there's a lot more room up there. There's casting platforms. Everybody's got more room. It's easier to fish off the front than it is the back. So the power pole for me is probably more important than the trolling motor on the flats. I like in the, in the, in the winter, I mean, you typically have a breeze. So you always you typically fish with the wind to your back. It works you across the flats. But if I can't see real well, but I do know that there's fish in the area, I'll power pull down, I'll fan cast an area for 10 cast. If I don't pick, if I don't pick a fish up, I'll pick it back up sure. and, I'll, and I'll take my boat to about where my last cast ended so I can do that and fan cast that a lot. Um, just have, and then once you do hook up, there's typically more than one fish in a spot. So once you land that fish, if it, something didn't follow it up, you can throw it back to that same spot. But you can't do that if you're drifting in a 10 mile an hour wind across a flat. So. So live bait, um, well, now let's say we're flats fishing again and we have a power pole on our, on, our, on our back. So Carolina rigs, in my personal opinion, with super small bait, you can find a sand pocket, fire it out there and let it sit in the sand pocket for a minute. If it's not picked up within a minute, there's no fish in that sand pocket. You can reel it back up and do it, this, do it the same way, or you can, um, you can use corks. The problem is, is when you've got a power pole in the water and you've got a cork that you're dropping away from the boat, what happens to the slack line? It picks it up, it puts tension on the cork, and it doesn't make the cork. Now, if you're flipping into the wind or the current and, you're, and the cork's coming back to you, it's a lot easier to work that way. The problem with cork fishing when you're fishing power poles on the flats is you immediately have tension and then you got to let all your line out and now you've got this weird whatever's happening with your line. You're just not that big of a fan. Now live bait too, um, if you're chumming more in the summertime, you got a little can full of chum that you worked up, you power pole down, you can flip live baits out. And then remember too, if you're fishing more than one person on the boat and you're power poled with a single power pole, and it's got some play back and forth, it's hard to throw those live baits and let them sit in one spot because people's line are dragging across each other back and forth that way. But the way that I like to fish in the wintertime on the flats 
is just like I mentioned to Bill the first time, if I have live shrimp, I've got this itty bitty owner hook. It's a circle hook. Number one circle hook is called a, a Mutu light circle hook. Pass those around. And you know what I fish above that? It is a split shot. Like a quarter ounce or a half ounce split shot. I let the wind work with me to get it to where it needs to go and I let it sit beside a dock or sit in the sand pocket. And <clears throat> the split shot, uh, may, maybe 18 inches. Um, ne never anything too, with too much play because it starts to have that lasso effect. What else you got on the live bait stuff, Mark? Well, I've been using a lot of small split shots lately. Mm -hmm. I think since I started running my trips inshore more now that the weather's getting colder and the days are getting shorter, I a lot of people get snagged with too heavy of a weight on split shots. We've been fishing a lot of rocks because I think certain times of the year when it's a little when the sun comes up and warms up the rocks, certain bridges and things like that that retain heat and mud bottoms, things like that, uh, but especially the rocks, the fish I think like that warm the warmth, the hot rocks, the, all that. So I feel like in the morning and certain times of the day, guys are throwing Carolina rigs right at these rocks. We've had a lot more bites on bottom than we have on corks. Uh, we've been free lining a lot, which is, in, so I think the Carolina rigs caught more fish than the free line and the corks for me lately have caught the least amount of fish, which in other times of the year, I kind of like my baits up higher. Uh, but the big thing that we've changed a lot lately is going lighter and lighter on the weight and it's kept us from being snagged a lot plus on a split shot normally your weights what's getting snagged and split shots have a tendency to open up so when your split shots snagged you can pull your line right back out of that mm -hmm. split shot a lot of the time so we've we've been going through a lot of quarter ounce and even sometimes smaller and plus just with split shots if it's you find it's drifting too much you can't go where you want you can clip another one on yeah it's a lot easier than tying to a swivel and having a <clears throat> an egg sinker moving up and down your rod. And two, people that fish braid, that's another issue, is when you're throwing, when you're trying to tie braid to a, to a straight to a swivel, and you're fishing like, say a one ounce egg sinker, you know what braid is? Bra braid can get hit, clicked, and yeah, right, it gets strong, but it also frays quickly. And it just feels like if you're fishing like a, a monofilament or something, you've got more play in it. And it's got more elasticity when you throw it and everything like that. So I try to stay away from the Carolina. Plus, it's you don't have to retie a swivel. You don't have to add another. You just take your bait and bite a little. Do you bite? Yeah. Bite, uh, yeah. The $400 pliers. Oh, the $400 pliers. I forgot. I, we bite a lot more than we should. Yeah. <laughs> um, so let's get a little bit deeper into the, the winter where it's getting a little colder and the fish are going to move off of the flats a lot. Now we're, now we're, I'm looking at two species. I'm looking at bigger redfish. So, I mean, there are some slot size fish that you can catch. They're, all these are down deeper in the water column, and I'm looking for big sheep's head. <clears throat> so I like to go out when I'm just by myself and I got two hours or an hour to work. I like to find a nice calm day. I like to run out to the center of the bridge, and I like to fish this size, jig head that's a half that's a three quarters ounce no that's either a half or three quarters ounce depending on what the current's doing that day and what kind of water movement we have and then I fish a gulp bait this one's a little bit old and this is a little thicker than I normally use there's a size smaller than that that's a five inch split tail it's called a jerk shad I think and but that color that that new penny color is my favorite by far. I don't care how clear that water is or how dark it is. That's the color bait I use. And I pull my boat, boat up to a piling. And remember the mid bay bridge, they have pilings that do this. So if you drop vertically beside a piling, you're gonna get hung up about midway through the water column. So you can pay attention under the water to which ones are vertical, which ones go out at an angle a little bit. And then I work around there have a good bottom machine to where you can see if there's any major growth coming off the, the bridge. <clears throat> I drop it down and hopefully it's, it's not so bad that I can even hold the side of the bridge with the front of my 
boat or with my hand and just sit there and tap vertically. And you know with those baits within 10 seconds if there's a fish in proximity there. If not, you work around the other side of the piling. Now the, the, the current or the water is moving into the boat, so it's easier to get on the back side of that piling and work those baits. But I'm always vertical jigging when I'm using that. The other way I like to fish, now I'm, and I'm using this rod for that. Now, if I want to catch fish, like, and I don't just want to focus on redfish, I want a chance to catch the little groupers, the snappers, but the big, like the big sheep's head that live on this bridge that barely anybody ever fishes for, I'm actually taking something like this out. So these are surf slash cubby rods slash king kingfish rods, but I'm fishing live bait now with Carolina rigs. I'm always throwing, I'm always fishing live shrimp. And so I'll go to half inch tackle and I'll get Eagle Claw makes a very short shank hook and it's a J hook. I don't typically fish a circle hook when I'm fishing for the sheep's head. It's a short shank. The shank is almost the same um, length as the actual hook all the way up to the point. And the reason I do that is there's one, sheep's head have incredible eyes so they can see that. I can hide that hook inside the meat of the shrimp. Okay, and it's just the, the ratio of catching fish is a thousand times better to me personally. And I love setting the hook on fish. If, so If you've seen the mouth on sheep's head, <clears throat> you, you'll see why you use J hooks. The J just gives a much better hook set than that extra curl on the uh, circle hook. So. And you need to use a heavier duty one because these are bigger fish and they have a lot more aggressive teeth. They have a mouthful of teeth like a horse. So, so I like to use that shank or that smaller shank so I can hide it in the in the um, in the shrimp. So when this is the way that I hook my shrimp when I'm sheep's head fishing. So the tail, <clears throat> I'll go over the top of the tail, and I'll bring the hook through. <clears throat> so this is the top of the shrimp. I start at that <clears throat> that last section. I go through because that's the that's the heaviest piece. I go through there and I bring that hook up underneath the bottom and I bury it back in the meat here. So the, the eye of that little short uh, shanked hook is right up against the tail and you can barely see hook here, okay? And it's in the meat, it's not in the head. That, that fish is going for the meat first, the, the, a sheep's head is. So is anything else down there typically. Um, and I, I usually use a shorter leader on that, like an 18 inch leader. I don't want a lot of play in leader because it's, it's sitting down there up around a lot of piling and a lot of just crap growing off. <clears throat> so I drop straight down. I'm still in the same position. I either want to be locked in with my trolling motor to where there's not a lot of play in the boat <clears throat> or I want somebody, if we're fishing one or two people, I always want somebody holding, holding the bridge. And the difference between, I don't know what it is on this bridge, but when redfish eat, they run away from the bridge. I very rarely have a fish that runs back into the pilings. The sheep's head are the polar opposite. So when I, hit, and when I feel that first thump or nibble, I know I'm hooked up with something, whether it's a mangrove snapper that's 12 inches or it's a seven pound sheep's head. And when I set the hook, I'm setting the hook at the front of the boat and I'm walking to the back of the boat as quick as I can just to get that fish out. And remember, I'm fishing with a seven and a half foot heavy action surf slash offshore rod. And I'm fishing that rod with 20 pound monofilament or 20, 25 pound mono. And I'm still using a fluorocarbon leader so that the fish can't see it as easily. But I'm using that one. It gives me a little stretch when I go to jerk it really hard and I start to run to the back of the boat. I've got a little bit of stretch, but I've caught so many more fish using that tactic and getting to the back of the boat. But you got you know, these fish, I mean, you don't have to drift off of it completely, but these fish will run you back up into the pylons. And we've caught, I mean, little two pounders all the way up. I think the best sheep's head I ever caught off this bridge was eight and a half pounds, which was big. That was a big one for me, at least. We, we caught our first sheep's head of the season uh, this weekend. Really? And it took second place in the rodeo, but on a Small J hook, a pretty thick J hook on a fiddler crab. Mm -hmm. uh, but it was the first one of the year, so. Were you fishing the jetties? Uh, 
No, no we weren't. Well, jet, there's a lot of jetties. I remember jetty, jetty rocks. Jetties. Yeah, we weren't fishing jetties, but okay. we. Uh, it was on a fiddler crab, on, with a small split shot, and I mean you can just tell it's a sheep's head by the way it fights. It's just, it feels different. You see the guy's rod acting differently, and you're yep. like, start screaming at somebody to get the net because that's a fish that we we needed. Yep. Um, and then you sometimes you catch ten sheep's head in a three hour period and you catch four reds. Sometimes you catch 20 reds and no sheep's head. And then sometimes I took my daughter when she was probably three and I'm out on the, I'm out at the center of the bridge, like on the fifth piling in, in a sport fish. And my buddy's running the throttles, keeping me away from the, the, the dock. And it's just, I've got little grace up there and I'm taking a bigger, heavier rod like that with shrimp and we caught a three pound pompano, we caught a 20 pound redfish, we caught two black drum, we caught a couple slot size reds, we caught two trout and a flounder, all within an hour. But it was because we were using live bait. I promise you, if we were fishing those gulps, we would have limited that to one or two species. So just, obviously there's more challenge fishing artificials, but the live bait thing is the way to go. And then the last thing we want to talk about tonight and, is... And every day is completely different, too. Right. Like, some days it's, one works better than the other. And you want, you want the net. You don't want to leave the net. If you leave the net, go back home and get the net. Because <laughs> you, you, you lose nine out of ten of those fish um, if, you're not, if you're trying to hand gaff them or whatever you want to do. I, I want to carry a net. But the last thing that, that's very, very good in this bay is the bull reds. And either sight fishing for them or following birds. So not everybody has a nice technical bay boat that they can get into super shallow water with or a technical skiff. And we have a 25 foot center console or a 22 foot center console or a 22 foot pro line walk around with a cabin. So we can't, we don't have the luxury of getting in skinny water. We don't have a power pole. We don't have a trolling motor, but we have our eyes. So we have eyes and a decent bottom machine, hopefully. So in our bay, as the water starts to drop, you see these big balls of bait that come in and then the schools of bull reds come in with them as well. And if you're fortunate, you get to see the school of bull reds on top of the water wrecking havoc on whatever they're in. It's awesome. And that is the best because the whole top of the water sometimes in a 20 foot radius, sometimes in a 30 yard radius turns bronze and all of this goes out of the window you could throw a banana in the middle of that and hook into a fish yeah but sometimes they're in a they're in a similar frenzy but they're just you can't see them they're under the water there's just as many fish uh, so what we the easiest way to find try to spot these fish are birds pelicans um, sometimes you'll see the loons around if you see a massive congregation of loons i'm not a big fan because i've caught a few and they stink. We hook a lot of birds. Yep. Um, also the little white birds. When you see the little white birds, so they're picking up glass minnows that, I mean, a glass minnow doesn't come to the top of the water because it wants to get eaten by birds. There's something underneath it that's causing it to get there. So you'll go through a couple of these throwing these artificial baits and you'll catch catfish. And they're, these are nice sized catfish. And then when you reel them up, I still don't understand how, and maybe you understand, and somebody out there I'm sure can, uh, can let us know, how does a catfish get 10 foot a line, a slime up your line? <laughs> how does that even so. happen? That's I mean, it, you always have tension on the fish, so it's not like it goes to the top and comes back down right. I'm not touching that I catfish. don't understand how that happens, and I don't want to know, and I don't want anybody to comment and give me an answer I either. I feel like a lot of times the catfish, when I first started fishing the bay a lot, the slower my retrieve, especially in those schools, it was always catfish. The mm -hmm. faster I worked my bait, and I actually kind of changed out what I like to throw in there a lot, uh, just so I can throw it a lot farther and rip it back a lot faster. But the slower, the deeper that bait was, it's always a catfish. More prone to catch one. And the, back to the birds, there's always, when you see those birds flying, you'll see birds flying around, you'll see them doing everything, but when there's that one white bird that's about that far off the water, flapping its wings real good. That's the one that I like a yeah. lot. So. It's probably staring at the fish. There's always one, and you'll see it now that I said that. Like you'll be running around looking at birds, and be like, "Wow, look at all those birds!" And you'll see one just going crazy, and they'll switch places.
but that one is always the one that I like. That's what we, we look. Just, I mean, you'll see where the birds are at. Just pull up slow. I always try to, I mean, it's very obvious which way the wind is blowing, which way the water's working. So if you see birds in front of you and you're running with a following sea, I would go around the school and just kind of, you know, you don't even have to shut the motor sometimes. I mean, you're in between 20 and 30 foot of water in most cases. So, and then you can flip your bait up to it. It's going to drop back better and naturally with that wind and that water moving towards you. And that's, and that's, lot, and that's, that's artificial fishing, right? So um, I, I started doing this with jigs and grubs. But a lot of people here troll baits, and that's I got a couple of them here. I wanted to one real real quick on that. When you see those birds, norm and I hate to say this, but there's so many guys on the bay now. Normally, when you're running around, if you, especially if you have somebody on the boat keeping their eye open, if you see a group of five boats on the other side of the bay in a circle moving together, they're probably working a school of fish. the The days that I find a school of fish, and I'm the only boat there now, are pretty rare. Um, so, if, and I hate to say it, but keep your eye open. And when you see a group of boats together, you can, most of the guys are pretty cool with it. I mean, there's too many fish in those, there's thousands of fish in those schools. There's too many for people to catch. But if anybody does spook them, if they run up too fast, nine times out of 10, we'll just kind of take the boat out of gear, sit there and wait, and you'll hear them. They'll pop right back. There's, that school of fish didn't go anywhere. They'll just pop right back up. They may be over there where the, football field is, but you'll hear them pop back up if, if you're paying attention. So this is, um, I think this is a 15 foot, 13 to 15 foot diving Yozuri plug. Um, obviously, if you're fishing, so they make these in 17s, 20s, 25, that here stretch 20, 25, 15s. So if you see that number on the box, that's about the max depth that'll go until it starts running back poorly. And then that means you're pulling it too fast or reeling it too fast. But this is, I think this is a 13. So if I'm fishing in 15 foot of water, it's probably doubtful that I'm dragging a 25. Because then obviously I'm just dragging this across mud or sand or crap across the bottom. It's not working right. And then also too, if I'm looking at my bottom machine and I see fish deeper in a water column around 30 foot or I know that they're these fish are buried at the bottom of the water column because it's been so cold, and I'm out at the middle of the bay, I'm pulling a stretch 25. I'm not pulling a stretch 13 because it's never gonna get close enough to the fish. So that's something you have to pay attention to. But going back to what you just asked, Bill, if you're trolling plugs, like I can't tell you how many times in the middle of the winter where it's nicer and, we, and we're all dressed in our Sunday's best, we're going out there, we're selling boats all day and we're like, uh-uh, let's go catch some fish. You can see the birds diving out in the bay. So we run out there and we just troll around the birds first. And then if we don't ha pick anything up, we'll troll back through where the birds were. And we've caught tons of fish that way. We've had sales meetings where we go out and do the same thing. Um, but you can, you're welcome to look at this. And the good thing about these, these rods, these are, these are my cobia rods. These are my live bait, deep water bridge rods. And just because, I don't use the smaller stuff just because the sheep's head like to run back in. So they're trolling rods, they're cobia rods, they do all that kind of stuff. And I'm sorry, I missed it. What month do the, the, the bull reds come into the bay? So the bull reds will start showing up now. Um, there's, there's been some fish caught. There's still some jacks around because of the, the warmer weather. But now that we're starting to get a little bit of cold, cold snaps, like this week we'll have two, um, I will tell you that around our bay, especially on the north side, in between the Brooks Bridge and the 331 Bridge, there's some bayous. Those bridges around those bayous typically hold fish. Okay, you'll see a lot of fish caught in front of the Rocky Bayou Bridge on this side of the Rocky Bayou Bridge over the next month and a half. And they're usually there for two weeks. You'll see one or two pictures of that and then you go because you know they're there. And those schools just stay around that bridge and they pop up when the bait comes around. Um, some of the bayous and the mouths of the bayous um, around the mouth of Hogtown, although Hogtown's a lot bigger, there's a lot of fish that move around in Hogtown Bayou around the mouth of Hogtown. But Aliquah, um, all on down by LaGrange Bayou, by the 331 Bridge, one of the best places is to run straight down this flat 
and go over towards the mouth of the, uh, the channel that runs into Sandustin, and you'll see them. And then I saw it, the biggest redfish I think I've ever seen, and probably because I didn't hook them, right there. Yeah. <laughs> and if they're not there, I mean, you'll see a lot of diving birds. So all the way out, you got three and a half, four miles there, all the way out to four mile point. Okay, you got all that stretch where that flat drops off from, it gets down to the 12 to 20 foot area, you'll see birds working and you'll catch a lot of fish there too. <clears throat> Both. Just remember if you're trolling in that area because there is a lot of fluctuation to depth, you want to troll a smaller bait like that, like 13 foot. Um, I but, found too that especially those bulls, I think the bait that they're feeding on instinctively swims into the wind. So in the morning, when the, we have that breeze coming out of the north, I feel like all the baits been up on the north side. Just instinctively, they, they filter out the water, so they swim right into the current. So I found in the mornings with the north wind, I fish the north side of the bay a lot more. And as the day goes on, especially when the big schools are up, and luckily mm -hmm. I'm on the boat enough sometimes that I can stay out all day, you can follow them back across the bay to the south side in the afternoon. <clears throat> And it's, it, they're, all, they're all along the drops. You can start in Niceville over here um, at, the, uh, at this side of the bridge, and you can run that drop off where you see there's a significant drop in that lighter, lighter um, water out to about a quarter mile off of it. But all the way through Choctaw Beach, all the way out to Basin Bayou where Trey Nick's place is, all the way out to Aliquah, that is a great spot. And the Choctaw Beach early in the fall is really good. Um, you've got the sunken ship out there. Um, so anywhere kind of in that triangle from here to the ship, which is kind of off of ba in between Basin Bayou and the four mile point, it's just really, really good, like real good. Also over here on Rocky Bayou, before you get to Rocky Bayou, that whole flat down Blue Water Bay, just trolling completely blind, which you're good at. Um, I, we joke a lot, he, he didn't see very well. Uh, trolling blind, like just start over here and right, right there by the little, the reservation, that government owned property right here on the bridge, get in 20 to 25 foot of water. You're off the flats a bit and you just troll straight, troll straight towards the mouth of Rocky Bayou. And that's, that's where my brother goes when he has a, a, a new fisherman that, that bought a boat from him. He goes there in the winter and he trolls these baits on these rods, these actual baits that are tied up and he always catches one or two fish in like a 30, 40 minute trip. And they're all, you know, 20 to 25 pounds. When you're talking about trolling, are you talking about trolling as an electric motor power or uh, engine? Engine power. So you're, you're not just sitting there with a trolling motor on the front of the boat or sitting there with a trolling motor. You gotta have a little more speed for these heavier baits with the bigger lips like that. So um, typically you're just an idle. Okay, but you're going to, you're covering a lot of ground in idle with a 200 horsepower motor, and then you can just have a simple spread. Like if you're running two straight out of the back, I like to run like one short and one long, semi-long. Um, and then if I'm running them out the sides, I like to change that up a little bit. You just got to make sure when you're turning, when you're making those, preferably if you think that you need to take wide turns in a vehicle when you're pulling a boat. You definitely want to take them when you got a spread of four baits out. And but I never really troll four. I troll two or three, and you'll know real quick. What's fun is when you get the double and triple hookup out here on this bay and the, with the when redfish you're, around. When pilots. you're by yourself. Yeah. <laughs> don't do that by yourself. Don't troll that many, because then you got to deal with them when you don't have a double or triple hookup and you got all those lines sitting there floating in the water. Uh -huh. That's why I've, I've never trolled. I've seen guys do it. But I'm <clears> just wondering, as spooky as they are, doesn't like, like, I have a two of you boat now. Can I troll in that? Because you're in deeper water. Yeah, I think those spooky fish are the individual, the onesie twosies. But when they're schooled up, those big schools of them that are hundreds or thousands in school, I mean, maybe I'm exaggerating a little bit, but there's so many of them. If you see them on the surface, they're easy to catch. But when you, like he was saying, sometimes that, that huge school's there right under the surface those and i don't recommend this but sometimes when they're up and i'm on a four hour charter and i need to get people on fish i'll run wide open about this close to them take it out of gear and say especially for kids who can't throw a lure 
just I'll get as close as I can to throw it in there. Those big schools are very hard to spook unless you run over them. Yeah. So in a, in a solo skiff, I mean, max horsepower, you what, got six horsepower or something like that? So, yeah. So you're, right. So you're fishing, and for people that don't know what a solo skiff, it's like a glorified um, paddle board with a little motor on the back. So it's kind of a kayak. It's kind of a paddle board. You can stand up and fish it, or you could actually paddle, paddle it. But it's got a little motor, boat paddle, boat paddle boards has come out with something similar. But anyhow, so you're typically not going to be out in deep 25 foot of water trolling with two rods just hanging off of rod holders because it's not, one, it's not real safe and it's not real comfortable. You fall in the water, something that small in the winter, it's just not as warm as it, it typically <laughs> is. But for sure, so when you're fishing in a solo skiff, and remember, the smaller the, the watercraft, the shorter the watercraft, the harder it is to get a good vantage point to where you can see. The higher you see, the further you can see, and the farther down you can see. The, also, the, the, the pro to being in a solo skiff or fishing off a paddleboard in the winter is those fish don't see you as quickly. Like these guys that are up in towers looking for them, they got to stay so far away from the fish. And yes, they're spooky, especially like, I don't know what it is about Knightsville fish, but they're very spooky. So you want to fish real light baits or really live baits. That's when I'm going split shot, three foot, nice fluorocarbon leader, um, about a foot and a half of, uh, of uh, length between the split shot and the hook, and I'm tail hooking a shrimp. And I'm throwing that shrimp out, just kind of like a quarterback leads a wide receiver. You have to anticipate that pass, where you have to throw it way out in front of that receiver and let it sit and wait for that fish to come across that line, um, especially in a solo skiff. Do you have a you have some kind of pole that you stop it with? Yeah, I have a pole, but, uh, but also about being spooky. You know, the Coast Guard station, that's famous for the schools hanging out yeah. on that flat over there to the west of there. And I used to have another boat where we had upper stations, so I went down there multiple times and I could have sworn that those fish didn't want anything to do with us. Height, yep. they knew we were there. Yep. So what you're saying is if you're in a boat like that, you need brains. You've got to get it out there and be separate. Mm -hmm. right. If you're fishing out of a tower or you're up on top of the deck of a bay boat, possibly standing up on a casting platform or a Yeti cooler or so, something like that, you're so much higher out of the water. And in the, in the wintertime, it's quiet, it's clear. Fish are just naturally spooky, but they... It's, it's, it's almost like they're pre they, they, they can see so much cleaner and, and easier. And typically by the time you see them, they've seen you. And they're also spooky with sound, so the lighter the bait, the better. The problem is, is that you have, that's why you gotta fish something super light with like a 15 pound braid, and you gotta get that bait way out away from the boat. And the, the brighter it is during the middle of the day, typically the spookier the fish are because the lighting, the low light conditions, I can't see you as well in the morning. Okay, so zero, zero, end of the first. Right. So let's just say regular, even in the wintertime, you know, pinfish are good. They're not as great. The, 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 the greatest bait that's ever been thrown around here on the flats and around these, these uh, bayou mouths is a, is a live croaker. And nothing can touch a live croaker. A, tr a big trout eats it, a big redfish eats it. When you're fishing the mid-bay br or the Destin Bridge, and you got 10 boats around you, and one dude's hooking up nonstop, he's fishing live croakers. And that, you catch those around the mouths and around the docks in these deeper bayous. Um, you can catch them just throwing little chunks of shrimp in on, on little brim hooks, and they load, their, they load them up. They have croaker traps, so they'll go out and catch them that way, but the croaker is the best bait, in my opinion, period, that you could possibly fish with in this area. And in terms of fish, pinfish are okay, um, a live finger mullet is amazing. Uh, the pinfish are, I've done well with pinfish, like deep dropping at the Destin Bridge, but it's, it's nothing like croaker fishing. And then just 
this is my deal. If, I, if I'm fishing Carolina rig, um, then I'm going to hook the fish through the, the mouth and the nostrils. Okay, so because the, the weight's going to sit on the bottom, the current's going to push the fish away from the, the egg sinker, and then the fish is going to swim naturally into the current. But if, and if, I'm, if I'm free lining and I need to get a bait down and there's not a lot of current, I can hook it through the dorsal or through the tail because you know what it's naturally going to do? It's going to drop down. <coughs> How about you, Mr. Live Bader? Um, I, use, I think pinfish work a lot better in the spring, uh, which are <coughs> harder to find in the spring. This might be why. Um, but for me on trips, I, if I can buy shrimp or buy fiddler crabs right now, I, for whatever reason, there's been so many black snapper this year everywhere, on every dock, on every bridge, on every rock pile, everywhere. The black snappers are eating all the shrimps. Um, but the fiddler crabs, only the redfish and the sheep, sheep's head are getting on, on those. So if I, for me personally, if I'm in a hurry, I'll just try to buy as much as bait as I can with whatever they have. I don't really have any luck on bull minnows. I don't know why. Tackle shops even sell those. Do you? The, fl the flounder fishing, the bull minnows are really good, like the near shore wreck stuff in the winter. They are really, really good baits for flounder fishing. I haven't had a lot of sex success with those outside of that. What else? Any other questions? Well, Mark has cards and he has a, a Facebook page and you can go check him out on Instagram and all that kind of stuff. It's 38 light tackle and I will tell you, he's got a tower and he, the, my favorite time to fish are the next three months. So it, you can bundle up, you always, the one thing we didn't talk about is gear. And I like to tell people this in the winter time, I've only been on a boat once where it was miserably cold on my feet and you can always take layers off you can never bring layers once you're on the boat. So it's better to overdress in the morning, especially for that initial run. But hire, you know, when you hire a guide, you're gonna learn a different technique than you typically fish, but you typically learn a lot from that guide, a lot more in a single trip than you would in 10 trips. And what's cool about Mark and what he does, he likes light tackle. It's not so much just about ripping lips and throwing meat in the fish box and all that. It's a, it's a more intimate experience and he likes fishing near shore. So you said like state water stuff. And guess what's great about the winter? You got a predominant north wind. So he can get in his tower, he can run the bitch, or the bitch, the beach. He can <laughs> hey, run, that bitch. He can run the beach. He can look for schools of pompano. He can look for schools of reds. And he, you can be two miles offshore and where it could be miserable trying to catch bull reds in the middle of the bay because of the wind. I mean, it's flat calm, and it's you're awesome. having a good time. You can see the water clarity is so much better. It's awesome. You know, in 60 foot of water, you can see, right? It's pretty fun. So I would suggest, you know, hooking up with Mark over the winter and let him take you out on a beach trip and uh, doing some fun stuff, because that's where I'm going to be. I'm going to be in this tower some this, this winter running up and down sight fishing for we'll be bundled up together. Yeah. It's nice up there in the sun, though. Yeah. I mean, we're two big guys, but I've, I mean, I've spooned and caught fish before. He's warm. Spooned. Hugged your friend. <laughs> yeah. So I want to thank you guys very much. It's been a cool year. I think it's all turned out very well. We had a phenomenal Fort Lauderdale boat show. I just got back yesterday and it's, it's, it's crazy to see what's happening in our industry. And, but people are, everybody's doing well. Real estate's great. Stock market's up. Thank you again for fixing my boat. Yeah, Bitcoin. I mean, every, everything's all right. So everybody's making money and everybody's having fun and we're starting to get product again and we have boats in inventory and tackle shops have tackle and it's just counter blessings and glad we're all here and stay clean and healthy and let's go have fun this winter, all right? Thank you guys. Thanks, Todd. Go Braves. <laughs>